Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Lippman House. I'm Anne Marie Lipinski. I'm the curator of the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard. Um, great to have you all with us today. Uh, for those of you who are tweeting this afternoon, hashtag Neiman, I before E. If not, you'll find yourself in some, you know, Twitter stream about spring fashion. Um, so uh, it's really a pleasure um, to host this conversation today. Um, I'll start by introducing uh, Professor Christensen to my right. Clay is the Kim B. Clark Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School where he teaches uh, a demanding and also much in demand class on building and sustaining successful enterprise. Um, he is the best selling author of at least nine books. I may have lost track of. That's good enough. Is that sufficient? Yeah, I know. There's, there's one on the way and at least another one that you're working on. So um, you have to check that count. Um, his first, uh, The Innovator's Dilemma, was arguably one of the most influential uh, works on business of his um, generation. And it established Cray as the father of disruptive innovation, a theory and approach uh, to innovation that a long roster um, of CEOs in this country and others has cited as transformational to their work and the trajectory of their companies. So when David Scott arrived at Harvard as the Martin Wise Goodman Neiman Fellow in the fall of 2011, um, he, of course, was familiar with Clay's work and um, interested in examining how deeply he could apply it to the disruption taking place um, in his own industry. David comes from um, a broadcast background, including his work as a producer uh, for Nightline, and he's now director of uh, digital for globalnews.ca in Toronto. And he spent much of his fellowship year examining Clay's theories of disruption and collaborating with Professor Christensen on what the research might tell us about building innovative newsrooms and innovative uh, media companies. So at the end of their study together, we said, well, don't just take it home to Toronto, share it with a broader world. And we asked Clay and David if they would please document um, their study together. The result of which was Be the Disruptor, a lengthy account published in Neiman Reports about mastering the art of disruptive innovation in journalism. Uh, the response to that piece, um, I can tell you, has been extraordinary um, and has had a long tail. So as many months after its publication, um, David and Clay and we are still hearing a lot about it. Um, the conversation in social media and in newsrooms and here at Lippman House um, and in the industry more broadly has been really um, heartening and um, we are grateful for you starting it. And it's of course a sign of the quality of their work but also just a deep desire that so many journalists have um, for direction and for um, new frameworks as they think about their craft and their industry. There was a third co-author who's not with us today, James Elworth. He's in Australia, um, a former student of Clay's who did um, terrific work on this as well. So um, to continue their collaboration and to um, continue the conversation that they started in Neiman Reports, uh, we invited them um, to Lippman House. Um, Clay, welcome back. David, welcome back. Always a Neiman Fellow. You're never Thanks. a former okay. Fellow. Thanks. So good to have you both. Thank you. Um, Clay, I wanted to, um, if we could, start establish some common language so we're all talking about the same thing. Central to your theories about disruption um, in any industry is this notion that um, uh, long successful companies sometimes fail even though it appears they're doing everything right. Yeah. Um, part of that is repeating old successful strategies, but also focusing on these so-called um, sustaining innovations and the top end um, of their markets. And so I'm curious if you can, so we're all um, speaking the same language, if you can establish for us the difference between 
um, sustaining innovation and disruptive innovation. And um, I'm particularly curious about that in the context maybe of something um, that's going on in our industry now, which is paywalls um, and, a, and an obsession about paywalls and examination of paywalls and whether or not that's an, exam, uh, an example of sustaining um, mm -hmm. innovation. So, Great question. So the way we define a sustaining innovation, and, and the vast majority of innovations in the economy are sustaining innovations. And essentially what they attempt to do is make good products or services better so that you can sell better products to your best customers for more profit. And uh, the leaders of the industry almost always are at the forefront of sustaining innovations. But disruptive innovations, the other kind, uh, is broadly misunderstood. And I made a big mistake when I called it disruptive because it has so many different connotations. And a lot of people think, well, it's just new and different or uh, radical. But we have a very specific definition. And that is, it transforms something that used to be complicated and expensive so that only the rich and people with a lot of skill had access to it and could use it. And a disruptive innovation makes it so much more affordable and simple and accessible that a whole new population of people have ready access to it. And it's really hard for the leaders to get this because they are different customers. It's a different profit formula, different ways of um, processes by which you deliver to the customer that they almost never are able to go after things that make it simple and accessible. So um, in telecommunications, um, the transition from analog to digital and digital to optical costs billions of dollars to de develop and deploy. And the leaders in the industry were right on top of that thing because it enabled them to make better products, to sell for better profits to their best customers. But the, the um, smartphone, I, I'm sorry, the flip phone uh, and wireless made it so affordable and accessible that people around the world could now have access to telecommunications. And almost in every industry, the people that were the pioneers there were not the wireline phones. These are new companies because this didn't fit the business model of the leaders. So that's the difference between sustaining and disruptive. And, uh, and it allows you to predict uh, who's going to win and who's going to lose in a battle of innovation, depending upon if it's, if it's uh, disruptive, entrants will win. And, and I think you see this playing out in journalism, too. So the theory seems agnostic to, industry, uh, to industries. And you've seen that, this repeatedly. That's right. And Auto industry, steel industry, hospitals. That's right. And you guys need to st stay tuned because it's happening to the Harvard Business School. It truly is. And nobody at Harvard even thinks about it. Can, can I just describe what it is? Yes. Um, so to get a Harvard MBA, I mean, you've got to be the best of the best of the best to get yourself admitted. And then we empty your pockets to the tune of like $120,000 just, and, and then you, you, um, you have f uh, two years of foregone salary. So this is a very intensive investment. Um, but thank goodness, um, our graduates are really good. And so last year, their salary plus bonus to start in their next business it was around $160,000. And man, that feels good. Because the more they get paid, the higher Harvard goes in the ranking of business schools, you know. And the more they get paid, the 
the deeper they can go into debt and the less we need to worry about controlling costs, you know. So it's a great system. But if you look at who recruits our graduates, there are very few operating companies who recruit our graduates. So there's no General Motors, no General Electric, no General Mills, only one Johnson & Johnson company, no Intel, no Dell, uh, no Motorola. But who recruits is McKinsey, Goldman Sachs, private equity funds, hedge funds, because we have overshot the salary that operating companies can absorb into their structure. And the consultants and the investment banking, they can pay the very high prices. But we have overshot in, tra just, uh, tr in classic disruption style. And so what's disrupting us is operating companies are pulling in the training of management inside. And they're creating their own corporate universities. Intel University, GE Crotonville. The best corporate university that I visited is Purdue, Purdue University. And this is not in West Lafayette, Indiana, but it's in Salisbury, Maryland. And Purdue Farms, the chicken company, has its own university. And they teach themselves while they work, you know. And it's growing like cr crazy. And Harvard just kind of sits around feeling no pain. Because these are all people who couldn't get into Harvard in the first place. And this is accessible, affordable, convenient, you know. So it really is. Would you extend that to, to include higher education in general? Or are you specifically thinking about the value of an MBA? Um, no, it's happening broadly. and. There, there ha in, in order for disruption to occur, there has to be what we call a technological core. That means a, a, an, an approach doesn't have to, have to be technology per se, but your approach works in simple applications, but then you can improve it to do more and more, to do more, and more sophisticated things. And th that has to be that has to exist in order for disruption to occur. So in how, how did Toyota kill General Motors? A technology that was called the unibody, where you didn't have to have a frame. It just was part of the, of the, the sheet uh, body became the, the structure. And at the beginning, you could only use that approach for uh, subcompacts. But it was extendable, so now you can make Lexuses with this unibody construction. And the microprocessor enabled Dell to go from simple personal computers to the most powerful uh, servers. And in higher education, there was not this technological core. And so if here in the Boston area, um, Northeastern, decides they want to make a world-class research university. They couldn't disrupt MIT. They had to emulate MIT. And uh, so they could go up market, but they could only go up market by emulating the competitors. There was no way that you could take a low-cost, affordable whatever and disrupt them. But online learning, now brings this technological core to higher education. So bringing this back to journalism, one of my questions is about, um, uh, maybe it's a question about slow learners, right? So um, this is an industry that uh, had seen this phenomenon before. And let's talk about an example you use, you, David, you and Clay use in the piece, which is Time Magazine, um, which starts as a, as a basic aggregator. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we'd now call it scraping uh, as we think about the internet, but gathering up news and information from other providers, putting it into something called Time Magazine. And so um, Henry Luce teaches a lesson that we seem not to have learned, and you know, around comes Ariana Huffington. 
What is that phenomenon, and do you, is that common in other industries too, where having once learned a lesson, the industry forgets it and has to learn it a very hard way all over again? Can I pass it over to David? Absolutely. He's smarter than I am, so <laughs> can you answer it now? Yeah, if, if um, well, I, I'll, I'll channel my inner clay if I may, um, which is impossible to do. Uh, but the one thing, when we look at our, our P&Ls, uh, our profit and loss statements every year or every quarter, we look at it and, and we're essentially looking at a snapshot of the past. We're not looking at the future in any of that. Uh, and so w whenever you have those quarterly or annual general meetings or whatever it is, most of the time you're focusing on these, these income statements or balance statements that are showing you what's happened in the past. What Clay's work does is it, it actually says, no, no, don't, don't trust that balance sheet. Trust a theory to predict what's going to happen in the future. Now, to be fair to any leader or executive or manager in any role, the notion of trusting a theory over hard numbers is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, and so that, that would, to, you know, that's just one kind of anecdotal way of saying it's hard to let go of that notion of trusting what the numbers and what we've historically always done. The second piece of that is uh, that those, those numbers and that drive for profit is based on margins that you continually need to drive up and grow in order to make your business more profitable for shareholders or whomever else. Uh, you have to show growth. And Clay actually can talk, I'm sure, about how he's looking at the economy as a whole and how and the the larger ramifications that may have on innovation in a global scale. Um, but in the case of journalism, it's really the same thing, which is uh, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, any of these companies, they need to continue to have large margins of growth. Uh, and so they're always looking for how they can continue to move up market. Uh, and by continuing to move up market, they're essentially suffering through what is called the innovator's dilemma, which is, we have to keep moving up market. That's what our shareholders needed us to do. That's what we need to do to continue to grow. Um, but at the same time, even though we can see what's happening below us, that's not a margin or in a, in a space that we really want to play in. There's the build on that. This is um, broadly a language that is used a lot in software and, and uh, computing that there's a stack. And what that really means is there's a process of value adding steps that you have to do in order to transform the inputs into the outputs. And this exists everywhere. But I'll just use the word stack to just is a, is a step in a process that we all are engaged in in one way or the other. And as disruption occurs, it commoditizes a layer in the stack. And so what used to be a high value adding activity, it was very profitable and that others couldn't replicate. Now it becomes cheap and easy so that anybody can do it. So there was a time when the collection of news and information was, was one of those layers in the stack where nobody could play that game like the New York Times. And then um, blogging and uh, wireless telephones and net messaging and what all, you know, there's a body of things have commoditized that so that anybody has access to more information than they could possibly use. And so that stack has become commoditized. But when that happens, Never does it mean that the whole industry has become commoditized and unprofitable. But almost always where you, make, where you can make the money uh, uh, flips to the adjacent layers. And so what you thought used to be a commodity in fact becomes more higher, and more, more and more profitable and proprietary. And so even as one business dies, it opens up the opportunity for other businesses to become cre to create themselves. You know, and uh, if you if you compare, for example, 
and Newsweek and Fortune on one side against Forbes on the next. You know, the core business just got killed. And uh, McGraw-Hill sold Newsweek to Bloomberg for a dollar. Um, and Fortune, I, I don't know, I never see it anymore. You know, But Forbes, while the traditional magazine got commoditized, they've created different business models above and below that are really kind of interesting. So let's, um, let's uh, introduce another term that is um, very central to your theory and that you, you both write uh, about in the Neiman Reports piece, which is jobs to be done. And it's, um, it's uh, not only is it, a, it a, is it its own theory, it's a theory in defiance of the way a lot of organizations work, newsrooms um, included, which is a very intense focus on demographics. So publications that are seeking the 18 to 25 year old male or the working That's mother right. or you know, name your demographic um, cohort. And this is not unique to, to, to journalism for sure, politics being another really excellent example of that. Um, and so quite um, separate from that, and again, uh, almost as a, a rebuttal to that, you develop something called jobs to be done. And can you describe that and maybe use a journalism example? Um, maybe David could add a journalism example to that. Sure. So <clears throat> here I am, Clay Christensen. And I have characteristics that, s that slot me into demographic segments. You know, So I just turned 60, unfortunately. <laughs> and I'm six feet eight, unfortunately. And we sent our youngest, Katie, off to Columbia, unfortunately. And, and I have all, all kinds of characteristics. But none of these characteristics or attributes have yet caused me to go out and buy the New York Times today. There might be a correlation between particular characteristics and the propensity that I will buy the New York Times, but they don't cause me to buy it. What causes us to buy something or, or, or hire it or um, rent it is, dang it, stuff happens to us all day. Jobs arise in our lives that we need to get done. And we hire products or buy products and pull them in our lives to get the job done. And what's important is that Understanding the customer is the wrong unit of analysis. It's the job that we need to understand. Because the job itself is very stable over time. And if you keep focusing on the job, you weather ebbs and flows of technology as they come into your industry. So I'll give you an example. Um, <coughs> There's a job out there needing to be done, which is I need to get this from here to there with perfect certainty as fast as possible. And this, we find ourselves needing to get this job done on occasion, right? Actually, Julius Caesar had the same job to do. But when he had the job to do, the only thing he could do was hire a, a horseman and a chariot to get the job done, now we have FedEx. But the job itself is just the same. The way you get the job done has changed over time. And so <clears throat> if you define your business by technology or customers, you can get blown out of the water with regularity. And so Western, Ju Western Union, uh, would be hired to do this job during the time of Abraham Lincoln. They framed the business as telegraph, long-range telegraph. And so when the telephone came, Western Union was just blown out of the water. You know? and, uh, but if you focus on the job, and you're always trying to get the job done better and better and better, then when new technologies come along, you can look at it and say, holy cow, 
that would help me do the job even better. And so you, ex you, you buy into it in a way that um, keeps the enterprise going. David, is there a journalism example that illustrates that? Yeah, so the one that we use in the piece that um, is kind of an enjoyable one is when you're waiting at the doctor's office, uh, you've, you've registered, you've checked in, and they tell you, you know, it'll be 10 minutes before the doctor will come and see you now. Um, people have been doing that for a very long time. But, you know, 30, 20 years ago, you would then sit down and see a stack of magazines that were probably a month or two months old. Uh, maybe there was one that you were interested in sports, but there wasn't a sports one. There was a People magazine or something else. Um, so you had to go with what the doctor had chosen were your, <coughs> the best choices for you to fulfill that job to kill that 10 minutes. Now, if somebody goes into a doctor's office and has the 10 minutes to wait, and they tell them they have 10 minutes, they'll, they'll probably pull out their smartphone and start surfing the web or start going on Twitter or read that uh, subscription to that magazine they get to decide what they want to read or consume during that 10 minutes. And to Clay's point, ultimately that's better. The technology has enabled the person sitting there waiting for, their, for those 10 minutes to fulfill the job in a way that suits them more than being forced to read a magazine that they weren't interested in reading in the first place. So um, to many of us, me included, um, there's a deja vu all over again quality to this conversation because will recall that, um, I think it was in 2006, you did a very um, uh, intense project with the American Press Institute. Um, I think it was called Newspaper Next. Yeah. Um, it had the, the full backing of the newspaper industry. And um, a lot of what we're talking about here today was articulated um, back mm -hmm. then. And I pulled out um, something that one of the journalists who had worked on the project then, who was very proud of the work at the time, but um, six years, seven years later, reflected, as someone who spent most of two years trying to sp spread the Newspaper Next message and issuing the Newspaper Next call for transformation, it pains me to look back years later and say we didn't bring about any significant lasting change. Um, I think the industry is paying attention in ways now that it wasn't then. But what accounts for that? Um, did we not see the cliff? Did we not see how steep it was? Was it that the you know finance the, the you know mortgage crisis hadn't occurred? What what was going on then, and what separates that from what you observe is happening today? Right, it's a great question. So, at its core, when I die. I'm sure before they la decide, they, they have to decide whether they're going to let me in or not. And so they're going to interview me. And before they ask their questions, I'm going to say, I got some questions for you. <laughs> and the first one is going to be, look, you put us on Earth and you oriented us to face the future. But how come you only made data available about the past? <laughs> this is what, what David points out. Because the f your choice of framing the world that way caused me as a professor at the Harvard Business School, man, I created chaos. Because I taught my students that they should be fact-based and data-driven and analytical in their decision-making. But because data is only available about the past, if you can't take action until the data is convincing, you will always take action when the game is over. And this has just paralyzed massive segments of, of our society. In uh, education, for K through 12 education, for example, any innovation, you are just afraid to adopt this new information until the data is, is convincing that the new way is better than the old way. But where does the data come from that convinces you that the new way is better than the Well, there's no data because nobody can create data unless they have data, if you know what I mean. They just can't move. And in medicine, it's the same way. And so for the management who are running, ha have this question that you've posed, they all learn to look at the data and when the data shows that the world is going to change, then we'll take action. But because of what God did to us, 
um, they can't take action until the game is over. And then another one, just visually, imagine that you're going up a uh, incline, and somebody said, there's a cliff on the other side, so be careful. And you go up to the, near the top, and you go closer and closer, and what you see is up. And you don't see the cliff, and so you're right on top of it, and then poof. And that's a, that's a critical thing. So do you remember Digital Equipment Corporation in this area? They went down the cliff in 1988. They, their profitability uh, hit its peak in 1986. And a company that took three decades to build was gone in two, de two, um, two years because you don't see it. The only way you would see it, as David said, is you have to have a theory. This data, has has, data has meaning only if there's a theory of causality that allows you to say, oh, this is what this means. And uh, most executives just don't think in those terms yet. So I think this is what Stephen Hawking must have meant when he asked, why can we remember the past and we can't remember the future? Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so um, David, from your, um, th there's a great t-shirt at, um, at the University of Chicago, which is proudly worn by the, mostly the economic students, I think, and it says, um, that's all fine in theory, but how does it work in practice? Uh, that's all fine in practice, but how does it work in theory? So you went back to the opposite phenomenon when you left Harvard and went back to your newsroom, which is, okay, now how does this work um, in practice? And I'm wondering if you could describe um, what, that, what that transition was um, like for you, and how have you animated this work in your day-to-day -day life? Yeah, it's, it's the challenge, and, I, and I, I think every student who's ever taken Clay's class has that moment where they're back at their desks and is now, now has, this, has these two giant binders worth of case studies and says, OK, um, there's theories in there that I need to apply. How do you do it? Um, so the, the unique, uh, I think I, I'm in a unique position because I've gone back to what is predominantly traditionally a broadcast company. And so there's more runway there uh, at the moment for the obvious reasons of the revenues in the broadcast journalism world are still at a place where we have the luxury to experiment. Now, if we do what Clay's theories say we should do, um, we're in that position right now where we can take some risks and start new ventures and, and figure things out. And so having that runway uh, has, has made it a lot easier for me, uh, the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, and we talk about this in the third section of the paper, which is the culture piece of this. Uh, ultimately. None of this works in a newsroom if you cannot um, get your priorities, your processes, and your resources all aligned around uh, the goal uh, of disruption that you're trying to do. And that piece is really, really hard. Um, how does it work? Well, you know, I'm, I'm here amongst uh, the smartest Neiman fellows around. And so you, know, you guys have all had uh, this year learned little nuggets of things, which beyond what Clay taught, um, around, you know, communication, negotiation, uh, uh, leadership, you know, all those things that come into play to, to make a case for why something is important. So that, that has to come into this, which is, you know, you, you have to really help people see for themselves what's coming around once that roller coaster goes over that cliff. And if they can understand that, um, then you can start talking about how you change things. Um, so how have we done it? Um, essentially, I would say our, our unit, globalnews.ca, is a disruptive piece of the broadcast business. Um, we are a standalone unit. Uh, we have our own budget. And we are essentially trying to be revenue neutral for now um, within the broadcast unit. Um, the, the thing that Clay always says that, that sticks with me is we're being very patient for growth but impatient for profits. Uh, and so that's fundamentally right now where we are. Uh, in every decision we make as a business, we're trying to determine if um, that initiative will allow us to scale in a way that um, allows us to grow 
but also always at all times maintains a margin of revenue neutral or profitability. Um, so that, there's that piece. Then I'd say the third piece is the culture piece, uh, which is, um, and, and Clay can talk more about the RPP model and, and how it works, but essentially um, it's the tasks that people do every day that determine ultimately an organization's culture. It's, it's not a priority set on high. It's not uh, the amount of computers that you have at your desk. Uh, it's, the, it's the, if somebody goes into work every morning and knows they have a widget and they got to pass that widget from one person to somebody else, uh, until you somehow change that process of making that widget go somewhere different, uh, you're never gonna change the culture. And so you have to change the tasks at their very, my, at their very core um, and then trickle that up through setting the priority on high and through providing the right resources. And so we've really focused on reorganizing our newsroom uh, around creating different tasks, essentially. We, have, um, we had a general assignment team in our newsroom, and we've now flipped that into a beat reporter team, as well as a breaking news desk team. And all of that was done um, with the understanding that these are changing the tasks that people do every day. Uh, and by doing that, we can then ultimately change the culture around um, embracing the disruptive business that we're trying to do. So let me ask one more question, then I'm going to open it up to um, others to ask theirs. Uh, and you, you've probably heard this in other industries, Clay. Maybe um, medicine is, a, is an example of one. But there's a problematic juncture for journalists around some of this, which is um, there's the jobs theory on the one hand, um, and then how does that square with the sense of um, deep obligation journalists feel to, you know, to the republic, to the future of the democracy, to truth telling, to doing things which um, often in the short run and sometimes in the long run are not um, profitable, um, don't appear to be um, good for business. You have to do things that are often unpopular in the town square. Um, so how, how are journalists to think about that? And how do you think about it as the theorist? Well, if you take a course in molecular medicine today and compare how molecular medicine is taught today versus how it is taught 30 years ago, Holy cow, you don't even identify it. It has changed so dramatically. So what's happened here? Did the science change? No, the science has always been exactly the same science. What we understand about the science has, has evolved dramatically. And so the job is very stable, but the way we approach the, the, the job it's very different as we learn more and more and more, okay? So just imagine that there is a job out there needing to get done, which is, I actually really want to know the truth of, about a phenomena. What's, what really happened that caused this to occur? And that job, Julius Caesar had that job to be done, as did Abraham Lincoln, as does Clay Christensen. But what I could hire to get the job done changes quite dramatically. You know, Julius could trust his lieutenants, some of whom were uh, honest, many of whom weren't. And um, a Abraham Lincoln had similar things to hire. And then I could hire the New York Times. And then a blogging comes in, in the realm and other ways of collecting data. And <clears throat> if, if you think about what happened in molecular, um, molecular medicine, if, if what you guys would do is just study the, the job to be done, and how could we get this job done better and better and better and better and better and better? Because you're, you're trying to understand the 
job at, at its core level. How, what can I do to get this job done better? Your job doesn't go away. In fact, your job intensifies. Now, it might be that you don't draw upon the, the global network of the New York Times uh, correspondence. There are other ways to do it. And blogging might re supplant the uh, printed newspaper. But if you, if you work to understand the job and, make, and do it better and better and better, just like the job doesn't go away, your profession doesn't go away. But if you think of the business that you're in as you make um, printed newspapers that people can buy at the tea station for a dollar ninety nine, you know, then your job goes away just like um, the uh, lieutenants of Julius Caesar. So, um, questions, <coughs> Josh. In your work, you do a great job of, of being both descriptive and prescriptive, of seeing, describing what this phenomenon looks like and then giving advice to companies that find themselves in that sort of a situation. And you talked about broadcast being a, a, a subsect of journalism that still has, you know, has fewer revenue problems than, say, the newspaper industry for the, for the foreseeable future. I'm curious if, from, from, your, from your research and from your case studies, you have any examples of companies within industries that are being disrupted that made a comeback at a very late stage. In other words, uh, I, having read a lot of your work, uh, you have a, a lot of what strikes me as very good advice for what, what to do if disruption is happening now. But if you look at, say, the newspaper industry in the United States, there are a lot of forces who have already left a lot of barns. And yeah. I'm curious if, you, if there are any positive examples out there of a late adaptation to disruption that were successful? Yeah, boy. Great question. I would put Apple in that camp. Okay? So Apple starts out as a computer company with a proprietary architecture. And another piece of our theoretical work predicts that the having a proprietary closed architecture is temporarily the right strategy. And then disruption brings to it open modular architecture like a Dell computer or Compaq or Hewlett Packard. And it's never as good as the proprietary one, but it, it, because it is so affordable and accessible and configurable, it, little, it literally pinned Apple to the ceiling. And at the time they did that, the people that did the marketing at Apple were unfortunately MBAs from places like Stanford. Not us, I'm certain. <laughs> um, but then when Jobs came in, uh, Steve Jobs, if you read his biography through our lens, he actually never studied the market from a, da a data point of view. But he just kind of hung around watching what people are trying to get done, what jobs are needed to be done. And he developed then a sequence of products that are focused on the job to be done. And what was really an after, uh, uh, afterthought in the history of computing just became an extraordinary company. Um, <coughs> because he framed it as, are there jobs out there in it, and develop products to get the jobs done. And so I guess the answer is there's a class of companies that have uh, um, re reinvented themselves or caught the next wave, but they always would catch it by a different job to be done or a different um, customer. Uh, there's a better one, even. So there's a company in India called Godrej, which is in India what uh, Whirlpool is in America. They make appliances. And uh, LG from Korea came into India with much lower cost and actually very reliable 
uh, lower price refrigerators, and they're just killing uh, Godrej. And they came in with these little uh, dorms uh, size uh, refrigerators, and then they went up. And so they read our junk, and uh, they decided that the only way to win was to come underneath Godrej, or go underneath LG, with an even more affordable refrigerator. And uh, because there's a huge population of people who just don't have refrigeration at all. And so they made this little box that they call the Chotu, Chotu, Chotu Cool. And it uses a principle called the Peltier effect. And whereas a traditional uh, refrigerator has a condenser and a motor and all kinds of moving parts, which each one of which could break. This has no moving parts. But there's a wire that is uh, bismuth and copper, and they join. And if you run the, electro the electrons in this direction, it emits heat. And if you run the electrons in this direction, it sucks up heat. And so they have this box that looks for, from us in America like a um, cooler, thermos cooler. Uh, but these, you've got these wires in the, the lid. And they just run it in this direction, and it sucks up the heat, and then emanates it out through the top. And it costs 39 bucks. And you plug it in, and it will reduce the cost to 4 degrees Celsius. So you can't make uh, wa ice, but it, it is so much better than nothing that it is a huge market that's just booming. And uh, uh, Godrej is on top of the heap again, uh, even though the core business is going away. This one is catching the wave, and, and LG doesn't know what to do. Henry, can we um, add something just to try and um, to hook it back to the journalism piece of it? Um, when, when Clay talks about Apple and how it, it was an integrated company and that was an integrated system, I think, and we write about this a little bit, um, there's a theory of Clay's called uh, interdependence versus modularity. And what it argues is that things break up and then essentially, you know, the simplistic version of things break up and then they reform and then they break up differently again and you can predict where they're going to break up and where they're going to reform. Journalism, uh, traditional news organizations, for the most part, have really consistently been integrated, closed organizations from the news gathering all the way to the distribution. It's all been one interdependent business. And the disintegration of that, the modularization of that, is happening as we speak. And I think we are now seeing a lot more experimentation around uh, generating of, uh, revenue from events, marketing, um, distribution marketing, all these kind of things, branded content, all of these things that are now part of a, uh, a, a modular type of business. And, and so yeah. to use the Steve Jobs analogy, if more organizations can look at their business through not one integrated, here's our newsroom from A to start to finish, but um, here are the different pockets of our newsroom that we could potentially leverage to create new business lines. Uh, I, I personally don't think that it's too late um, for that. Mary Beth? Hi, thank you. I'm Mary Beth here from the Washington Post. I'm an even fellow this year. Um, I was just wondering if you could go a little more into depth on, when you think about newspapers, what do you see as the jobs that are to be done? And I'm curious about the advice that you came up with uh, seven or eight years ago that was that was never followed. What, what was that? <laughs> well, the... So, um, I, Clay Christensen, today, have had a whole bunch of different jobs to be done, you know. And so, if you're trying to understand Clay as the unit of analysis, it's very confusing because I have so many different jobs to be done. 
And so you might be, if you have a relationship with me, you might then want to sell me one thing that I could hire to do any job I wanted to do, you know. And as long as you don't have competition, uh, that works just fine. But when somebody comes in to focus on a specific job to be done, you are competing with the one-size-fits-none general proposition with somebody that has designed its whole business around getting the single job to be done. And so personal ads got nailed by Craigslist. First eBay and then, you know, and they do that so much better than a newspaper could, you know. And so you're competing against a focused competitor. And then you had this massive source of uh, profit from companies that are trying to hire people, you know. And now Monster.com comes in and picks that one off for you, you know. And you can just go through um, retail advertising, and now um, retail.org comes in and, you, you know, so that's what's happened is when you try to offer everything for everybody, you can't focus on doing any job perfectly well. And so you get just picked off one job at a time. And so the challenge now is, are there jobs for which there, has not, there have not yet emerged pliable competitors focusing on the job? And I, I, pro, I will uh, offer a few. One is what we talked about before. That is, I'm, 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 I'm just awash in information. Could somebody help me understand what is truth? What's true about this? And I don't see anybody who really has nailed that job. The New York Times thinks that they are trustworthy, but I, you know, it's, it's not clear that they've nailed that job to do. There's another job, which is, you know, at the end of the day, I just need to relax and, and unwind myself. And yeah, I could watch the TV to unwind, but I could also pick up the, the, the Washington Post to unwind. That's a job to do. And you, don't comp you compete against very different competitors for people to just reflect and relax. And, and uh, there's another job. This happened when we did our news, newspaper, news peep. I had a stroke that killed my ability to speak, and sometimes I can't find the words again. You're doing um, just fine, yeah. Professor Christensen. <laughs> um, Newspaper next. There is a, I can't remember whether it was a Gannett or some, some newspaper in um, Palm Springs that was a Spanish newspaper owned by one of the big ones. And it was just struggling along, you know, and so they, in order to get more um, subscribers, they tried to uh, lubricate and, and uh, finish their feeds from Latin America. So they just had the best news as fast as possible and, you know, and none of that improvement um, changed the, the profit, uh, the revenue line, uh, but it just had cost and it was kind of going under. And then the team that did this went in and the question was, are there jobs out there needing to be done for which this newspaper might be hired by the Latin community? And, uh, and what they re decided is that, yeah, there's a massive job needing to be done, which is we live in a nation that minimizes and, and um, what's the word? They, they don't respect Latinos. And we're, we're people that merit respect, but we don't get it. And we need to feel pride in ourselves, in our community. 
that this is a place where good people want to be and live. And so knowing that that's the job, news was actually of what's going on in Guatemala was quite irrelevant to this job to be done. And so they minimized news and maximized um, photos. And, and, you know, and so their, their uh, reporters were going around with, with cameras trying to take as many photographs of people in the community who were doing good things. And they didn't add a, have a lot of verbiage about what they were doing. But, and so everybody started to buy this thing to go through it to see are any of their friends there. Yeah. And when they s see just visually everything that's going on in this community, they feel pride, you know. And by nailing the job, the, enter the economics of the enterprise just turned right around. So um, what does that mean for journalism, for journalists who, who want to play in the truth game? They probably wouldn't enjoy working in this world. And the news that you were delivered has a very different purpose there. But I think there are ways to, to create the next generation of uh, the distribution channel for your efforts. Um, but you have to organize it around a job to be done where you've got better ability to nail the job than any of your competitors. That's, if I could follow on that, because I think there's an interesting example at the Post, and there were in some other markets as well, and that was um, the rise of the free commuter um, weekly. One could yeah. say that the job to be done was to fill this time, you know, when you were <laughs> stuck on a train, no Wi-Fi, right, underneath the streets, um, and that you knew about how long that commute was going to be, and so you developed this um, news response to that. One of the interesting things, though, and it'd be interesting to hear what Mary Beth or Alex think about what happened at the Washington Post or, you know, Blair at the Chicago Tribune, where this was um, executed fairly successfully in terms of circulation and what the ad revenue said. But what happens um, in the incumbent or the legacy newsroom in response to that? And you guys write about this in your piece, and that is the, the, the real challenge of doing something very different from what has brought the company to the dance to begin with, what it has succeeded um, in doing, and suddenly you have this upstart um, enterprise, mm -hmm. and you use some very harsh language in the piece to talk about. I mean, it almost sounds like you know Sigourney Weaver and the Alien. I mean, it was, it was his you know language, people attacking yeah. and <laughs> trying to destroy this new thing that's been created, and really the company in, at war or a newsroom at war with itself over some of these innovations. And I'm sure there, I mean, there are lots of other examples we could. Um, yeah. we could name to illustrate that. And so I'm wondering how you think about that. Um, I think you're f a fair proponent of um, incubating these things outside, um, outside of the mothership to continue the Sigourney Weaver uh, metaphor here poorly. But um, I wonder if both you and David could talk about that and maybe some of the journalists here also have perspectives um, on that. It's hard to do. Yeah, yeah so I guess that the immediate visceral response to that is if, if you can see the disruption of your own business, chances are somebody else out there can see it too. And so you're better off disrupting yourself before you're, uh, I, I, I know Josh is now using this in his, uh, his podcast, disrupt yourself before somebody else disrupts you. Um, so that, that's kind of the immediate hard and fast. It, it, it's almost a defense mechanism that you have to take. Um, Clay's research is, is very clear on this, though, that you, ha you have to incubate it outside of the existing processes. And this goes to the notion of culture that, that I mentioned earlier, which is you cannot change the tasks that people are doing every day for a different priority while their existing priority is still <coughs> um, effective. So to give you a perfect example, I work in a broadcast newsroom where there are some very talented, qualified people who produce 
television news every day. And they do it well. And it's very tough. And I don't think they have many hours left in their day to do a disruptive business along with what they're already doing. And so to ask them to change what they're already doing, which is working, for a disruptive business, it's just going to get swallowed into their existing priorities uh, because that's not the priority that they have set for that business. That business has a particular margin that it's supposed to reach, particular targets. And to ask them to not go for those targets when that's their goal uh, set from management is it, it's just going to flounder. So you, you have to separate it out so that you can have a different business with a different mar profit margin and different tasks to, to, to spur that growth. Yeah. To add to that, what makes it even harder is the way you define goodness changes in, in the disruptive way versus the traditional. So uh, just a couple of examples. In online learning, we look at online learning like the, the University of Phoenix, just down the nose at those people because there's no face-to-face -face interaction with the professors who are just you know, the best teachers in the world by our definition. And, uh, and, and you're not face-to-face -face arguing over important issues with your classmates. And that's the way we define goodness in our world. But there's another world out there, which is people who are 35 years old, three kids, no degree, need to get a better job. I work all day, and I just need to get three more courses under my belt and I get certified for that job with Microsoft. And we look down at it saying, they don't even get a degree. You know, and there's no interaction with their classmates. And from his point of view, the last thing in the world I want to do is to go at 8 p.m. at night after a long day when the kids are home and I haven't talked to them yet. And, and so, what the goodness is, is very different. And so you come back to the, um, what can I hire to, to uh, um, profitably spend the next 10 minutes while I'm on the, the subway? Um, that's a very different, what goodness is viewed there is very different than the people who put together the Washington Post uh, op-ed page define as goodness. And, and it's not relative to one another is the wrong unit of analysis. You have to, relative to the job to be done, which one is better? And for that job, the full New York Post, or the Washington Post, doesn't do the job well. <laughs> it's hard. Laura? <coughs> Hi, I'm Borja Tuarina, and I'm a fellow and a student of your class. He suffers through my class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would like to pose a question looking to the future through the theory and also through the practice, it's a question for both, about mobiles and what do you think, uh, what is happening with mobiles and how people are consuming news? Do you think it's a disruption inside a disruption? And how should people and companies react to what is happening to to the fast pace people are starting to consume through uh, mobiles? Yeah, this is, uh, I, I was asked a question at a, a conference a couple of weeks ago about that. Um, uh, what, do I, what do I personally consider as disruptive now? And mobile is the first thing that comes to mind for me um, as a technolog technological disruption of even digital news as it, in its current form. Um, I, the, the jobs that can be done better through mobile are immense. Um, so I, I know personally we're, we're spending a lot of time and resources committed to figuring out a mobile strategy for us that works. Um, you know, and the, and the question, that, the follow-up question that you get when you say that is, well, where's the mobile advertising dollars? And my answer to that would be, well, advertising is not necessarily your line of revenue. There's many <laughs> other lines of revenue that we should be looking at. and so. The, the general reaction that you get is, OK, if mobile is the future, that's great. But where are the dollars to support that? They're not there yet. Um, 
and I, I would argue, well, that's kind of taking our old way of looking at uh, of um, how we can be profitable and, and make money and applying it to a new, uh, a new tool, um, whereas we just need to flip that and, and yeah. I, and I think um, from a journalistic standpoint, what's really interesting about mobile is how it's actually changing um, the journalism that's done. That's pretty exciting, whether it's live blogging uh, or the fragmentation where citizen journalism really can come into play on a mobile in a way that it had never been before. I, I, as a journalist, I, I, I find that fascinating. And that's also contributing to the, um, the, the, the fragmentation and the modularity of the industry as a whole. Um, I'm looking, of course, at disruption as a solution, but again, speaking about innovation um, in this digital age, I'm sometimes wondering if there is really a place for ev everyone in this new era. Um, I mean, actually, there is very few companies such as Facebook, Google, Apple, and so on, and very few players in the media outlet that really reshape and control the economics of this world. Um, and maybe more than ever, this idea that winner take all. Um, do you think that there is a risk of seeing a less diverse world in the future? I mean, in a cultural way. And what do you think of the role of the giant of the digital are playing today regarding to our industry? Can you try that again? And then I'll add. Sure. Um, well, the one thing I'll just, just uh, as a, a tangent there, I read a study a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to get it completely wrong, but I'll quote it anyways, where uh, <laughs> it talked about the filter bubble in, in the online space and the messaging, and it, it referred specifically to politics, and it actually it countered the argument that we are living in a filter bubble on the internet, that in fact, nobody has just Republican friends or just Democrats friends on their Facebook wall. They have everything. And so uh, the, the, the study argued that actually what we're seeing is a more diverse world of opinion, not, not a less diverse world. Um, so I, I know that's not really related to disruption, but I, I thought it was an interesting tangent to put on there. Um, so Facebook, Twitter, Google, yes, they're dominating the, um, the, the revenue pie right now. Um, but I think if you go back to the theory of, uh, and correct me if, I, if you don't think it's the right one to use, but if you use the theory of modularity versus interdependence and you look at it, we're in a point where now the industry is contracting to a few players. We used to have, you know, every few years there was a MySpace, there was a, there was a Facebook was one of many mm -hmm. at the time when it first started. Um, so we're now in a contracting phase, but all that means is that then to use Clay's theory, what's happening above it and below it, nearby, that you could then disrupt. Because um, it will open up again at, at, at those levels. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. And when this one gets commoditized and it opens up the new ones, you see them, you see a job to be done that you didn't see before. You know, And uh, for example, in, in my world, getting the information that I need that is, I can trust it. And so that, the, and the analysis I can trust as being um, not biased in any way. I didn't realize that there was a job there that I needed to do until this, level, this got commoditized and all of a sudden the potential to have somebody here to do the job emerged. You know, and uh, as a general rule, when disruption occurs, the market b balloons be by making it affordable and accessible. Uh, many more players, people are in the game, and so if we could measure it, I, I think you would it would show that your profession is just booming. Employment is just booming, but the different skills in different places in the stack. Paul. Hi, I, 
from Paula Molina. I am from I come from Chile, which is a small country in South America. It's a big and, country. <laughs> <laughs> and I am a radio person. And I would like to ask you a very simple question and I don't know if I may ask you to as a business school professor and a student that I is there always a business model? Because <laughs> because I work on a radio and I am I'm, I'm listening to BBC. And I don't know if there is a business model there, but it's a it's a public company, and I am listening to National Public Radio, that actually asks people to pay for the news. So that's my question: Is there always a business model? There always is a business model, okay. even a family. That's good. <laughs> family has a business model. A church has a business model. We have a very simple way to frame it: that there are four elements of a business model. <coughs> And the first one is the, the value proposition. <coughs> that there is a job out there, and we're going to try to be good at nailing that job that, so that people will hire our product to do. So the value proposition. And then in order to deliver the value proposition, you have to have resources. People, cash, technology, and so on. And as you use the resources to deliver the value proposition, processes emerge. And as, as David said, processes are just ways of doing things that you use over and over again uh, reliably and successfully. And then the last one is a profit formula. That is how I get my resources, how I, how I get my money to cover the costs and get the uh, resources from. And so NPR, their profit formula is donations. In the Mormon church, it's tithing. In a for-profit, it's the customers who paid. But they all have a profit formula. And that determines uh, the business model. And the business model is, uh, is designed not to change but to deliver a particular profit formula uh, rel reliably over and over again. And so that's why <coughs> when disruption occurs, you have to do what David said, because the new business emerges while the old business is still viable. And if you, because this wasn't designed to do that, if you try to get it to do that, it screws up a good business. Uh, and if you wait until this is sick in order to do this, the game is over. So that's why you have to launch the two, two different business models. So maybe my, my question was, if, is there a business model based on advertising for the news? I'm sure there's a business model except for the first of the four, which is the profit formula. And is there a job to be done for which I would pay for the news? Maybe, um, but it's the right question. The fact that it can be done, people will only hire it if it helped them do a job. Um, so as another good example, um, you notice before we had the iPod, um, the only way to get, an, well, if you, want, you wanted to get music, that would, the job was, I need to escape the world. And I need music that will help me feel like I want to feel. There's, some, there's a job like that, OK? And so we figured out we could download free music through Kazaa or Napster. And you could get this thing from Creative, which was an early MP3. And it kind of went kind of a kludgy way. And when Apple came in with an integra integrated, optimized system, they said, uh, 99 cents per, per song. People just, I would love to pay you money for something that gets a job done. If it doesn't do the job well, I'll be darned if I'll pay you a penny for it. 
Michael? So, uh, I'm Michael Fitzgerald. I was on Neiman in 2011, and I obviously should have taken your class. But um, <laughs> um, I've been a freelancer other than that for about a decade, and so I've written for four dozen publications, ranging from the New York Times to publications I'd rather not name or that are dead. Worth Magazine one of them. Um, and so my experience is that there's, um, I, I, this is a paywall question really, or a pay for content question. My experience is that for different publications, uh, uh, there is a different value to these publications. That, you know, the New York Times is not commodity news in the way that some of the other sites I've written for have been commodity news. And then I write for magazines, which at least from a text perspective and online have the same problem. I can get $2.50 a word writing for Fast Company or 250 bucks for an article on his website, uh, which works out to about a quarter a word for what they they, uh -huh. they want. I mean, so there are huge disparities, and it, and I feel like, like I mean, I didn't I felt in my Neiman year like I was going to walk back into a, a world where there was no value for what I did, and what you said before kind of sounded to me like there's no value to what we do. It's all commodity, um, and so I really struggle with. The, but I, and I, I, but my, I struggle with that idea in part because my experience suggests that it's not true, that there is a value, that people do value these things. So why can't there be some kind of pay model, given that not only do we have disruption because of commoditization of, of information, let's say, of news, we also have the commoditization of advertising, which is really kind of a culprit, because we built all of these text-driven businesses anyway, are built around uh, aggregating audiences that have a certain kind of value to advertisers yeah. who no longer need that. So, I mean, Starbucks has convinced us we have to pay more for coffee than we should. Can't we figure something out for sort of Starbucksing <laughs> text? <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's an interesting experiment going on right now uh, with um, Andrew Sullivan, who started his sure. uh, Sully Sully dish, um, and it's essentially he's saying. I'm not relying on ad advertising to subsidize my business. I'm going to go straight to the reader, and hopefully they will be able to cover their costs. Um, he has a very unique style of writing that's particular to him, but that's his job to be done that he's satisfying, because for whoever it is, if I, you know, I really want my Andrew Sullivan fix today, mm -hmm. or his take on this, that's a job. Well, he also, he's a Political information is worth something to the market, and so if you think Andrew Sullivan's brand is going to be worth something, you'll pay for that. That's why the Economist still makes, still charges 130 bucks for a subscription and can get away with it. They frame the way they frame their articles. That's why the Journal and the Times can still get people to pay, or the Financial Times still get people to pay. There's not commodity information, and, and if you're so, I think Sullivan's an exception to the rule. You're saying he's going to become a, a well. Model. I would say he he. There's a lot that we can all. Learn. Now, will he be able to do it is a question based on his overhead costs. Um, I don't know how much it costs for them to maintain it. I know that he's about two-thirds of the way there to be able to say, okay, we can do this um, for a whole year now because we've, we've got enough subscriptions. Uh, so I don't know what his cost structure is. Mm -hmm. But let's assume that he can actually pull it off and that his cost structure is low enough that he's revenue neutral at the very least and is able to do this. Um, that's a good lesson for us all to say, not necessarily looking at he is doing political opinion, but he is doing something of value that people are finding willing, worth paying for. And I'm going to flip that around and say that's actually a really good thing for journalism, because it means that we have to be more accountable for what we put on the page or what we put on air. Because ultimately, we don't want to be commoditized. We want there to be value and unique value in what we're doing. Um, we can no longer be a mile wide and an inch deep. We have to go deep on particular verticals, in my in my view, um, to generate value that people will then determine that is worth me paying for. But I think one of the things that we've argued throughout this thing is that it's not it's not just advertising. It's not just subscriptions. It's a whole bunch of things that you have to be creative about looking at in that value chain for your business where can you find value that you can then create a business model around? So there may be three business models as opposed to what we're used to, which is one or two. Um, and one last thing I'll say about that, which is very, I think, positive. While you may be getting a quarter per word today, and on, in a print paper or a print magazine, you'll get $2 or whatever it is. If we assume for a second that every print newspaper is wiped off the map, then in order to find value in what we do, um, History would show us, and 
the theory would argue that those at the bottom of the market are going to have to move up market to fulfill that, that void in the market. And so in doing so, they'll probably have to charge more per work. Um, so if you let the theory play out, uh, I think there's actually a positive news story developing here around creating news of value that's not commoditized and ultimately um, letting these disruptors do their march up the value network. David? Uh, thank you so much for being here, Professor Christensen. Um, I'm, my name is David Abel. I'm a reporter at the Boston Globe. And I'm wondering what you make of our sh sort of strange dual uh, website strategy, whether you think that works as a business model. Um, and I was also wondering, given your long-term friendship with Mitt Romney, whether there's any truth to the rumor that he might be among a group of people trying to buy the globe. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> well, I don't know the finances of the print and, and Boston.com, but it feels to me like Boston.com is a very different animal and to be hired to do very different jobs than this. And so if I could crawl inside, I would predict that it's a, a standalone entity that has a, lo a lot of upside potential compared to the globe. And my, my belief, if I'm right, is it's actually quite a different organizationally. It's, it's produced not in the newsroom. Well, it's, it used to be. It's now in the newsroom. Now they, oh my gosh. <laughs> so now I have no opinion. The theory has an opinion on this, <laughs> which is to be uh, put on your helmet because it will force Boston.com to conform itself to the newsroom. That's the way it always works. Sorry about that. Mitt Romney. I don't know. But uh, the, I thought a lot about Mitt in elections. And um, this would be a fantastic project for while you're here or stay on for another year and do this with me. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> so, um, I'm listening. <laughs> the pollsters, you know, come back to Mitt and they say, you're almost dead, man, because you're 18% behind Romney with women. So what do you do with this? Like, how do I get the votes of women? There's, a, there's actually some variability amongst women, but how do I get them to vote for me instead of Obama? And then somebody comes and, do you realize that the Latinos are going 70-30 for, for Obama instead of you? And so he says, geez, how do I get the vote of Latinos? Well, the only way you can do this is to offer everything to everybody. And then Obama, in order to defend his lead, has to respond by saying, I will actually give more of everything to everybody. And it causes them to lie and deceive the public. And, and, and the reason for that is that being a woman isn't a job. You know, it's a characteristic of particular people, but being a woman it isn't a job to be done, you know. And I bet you that, um, so like there's a, there's a job out there, which is the folks in Washington simply can't agree on anything. And we need a leader who can help people who are antagonistic to come together and put together a plan to solve a problem. We need a leader who can do that. That's a job to be done. And I bet you that if Romney had positioned himself around a job to be done, um, it would have been a very differentiated campaign. And, uh, but if you think that the world is structured by a demographic, uh, 
segmentation. You just you, you have the the uh, elections like we just had, and if instead the opponents had articulated, there are five or six jobs out there that people need to get done. And I'm going to differentiate myself by nailing this and that jobs perfectly. It would be a very different election. It would be interesting, intellectual, uh, inventive. You know. So if you ever see Mitt, tell him that that's what I think. <laughs> um, we're, uh, we're, we're, we've run out of time, but I just... Um, uh, Professor Christensen, um, you give a, uh, you have long given a sort of valedictory lecture um, at the end of your course, uh, which then recently became the book, um, How Will You Measure Your Life? And um, it's a terrible thing to do, but journalists do it all the time, to ask you to compress your work into, um, <laughs> into, into a, a, not quite a sound bite, but uh, uh, I'm wondering if you had a valedictory um, sort of thought for this group um, as you've heard what's on their minds and this framing about um, disruption and journalism and um, any sort of counsel to them as they think about how to measure their year here and um, also how to measure their their career and the impact they can have in that conversation at the gates that they'll all be having someday. Well, it's a great question, so I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> So uh, some time ago, through a uh, series of events in my own life that I don't need to get into, I got this insight that God doesn't hire accountants. And, and what I mean by that is because we have finite minds, in order to understand what's going on, we have to collect we have to aggregate things in terms of numbers. And so um, I can't figure out what sales are looking like by keeping in my mind independently all of the, the, voice, uh, the invoices that we've set out. Uh, and so we hire an accountant to add all of these things up, and he gives me a number that says sales. And then I look at today's, this year's sales versus last, and if it's a bigger number, I'm doing better. And if, you know, um, so we have to aggregate things up in order to know what's going on because we have in, in uh, finite minds. But then I realize that God has an infinite mind, and therefore He doesn't have to aggregate things up above the level of the individual in order to have a perfect understanding of what's going on in the world. And that's why he doesn't have to hire accountants, because he doesn't need to aggregate above the level of individuals. And under my frame, where I have to aggregate things up, I got, you get this sense, and I certainly got this sense, of hierarchy. So somebody who presides over bigger numbers is more important than somebody who presides over smaller numbers. A CEO is more important than a reporter because he presides over bigger numbers. But when I look at it from God's perspective, that he doesn't have to aggregate, then I realized, gosh, when I have my interview with him, uh, he's not going to say, oh my gosh, Professor Clayton Christensen, Harvard. That's not going to come up in the conversation. He's just going to say, all right, I let you be in that situation for about 25 years. Let's just talk about the individual people who you helped to become better people um, by the talents that I gave you. And then uh, I stuck you there for about 10 years. So let's talk about the individual people who you helped to become better people. And uh, t against my better judgment, I gave you five children. Can we talk about, did you help them become great people? You know, And uh, I, when I realized that the way God will measure my life 
is by the individual people who I helped to become better people. I started to calculate things in a very different way. And that is, every day, I hope to find somebody who I can help to become a better person. And with that definition of how I will measure my life, it's just totally changed the way I think. Um, and I don't want to impose my feeling on, uh, on all you guys, but I do think it's a great way to think about uh, how, will you, how will you measure your life and how does that m mesh with how judgment we, will be given to you to, at the end of your life. And just be sure that you uh, organize your life so that you do a good job at that metric. And I'm really quite happy. I, you know, I can imagine that I would spend my time writing for Jillians, uh, thinking that if I change the way they think, um, that's a good thing for how, how I will measure my life. But it is so much more um, satisfying to think about individual people who I help to become better people. Anyway, but that's how I think about that. Well, I'm pretty sure that applies to the agnostics and the atheists in the room, too. So thank you so much. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for letting me talk.